recording. All right, I'm just gonna do a quick test and I'm gonna see if it works. This will just be the audio test part of the program. Testing three, two, one, two, three, two, one. All right. Okay, testing audio. Let's see, um, going to my channel. It does not say that I'm live right now, so it might not be live. Let's take a look. Hmm. YouTube live, let's see. Testing, testing, testing. Technical difficulties. Technical. Unique New York, unique New York. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Okay, let's see, what do I have live now? Live, 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 YouTube studio. Hmm. Channel dashboard. Um, go live. Okay, here we are. I'm on my live page. And it says I'm live right now. Okay, wow. So it is live. Great. Uh, okay, save on go. Let's see. It says it's not receiving enough. Um, okay, not receiving enough video. It's poor quality video. Okay, I'm gonna fix this really quick. One moment. All right, back for more testing. Let's see what happens. Okay. Stream finished, but let's see if there's a new stream. Okay.
Do we have audio? Yes, we do. All right, it seems like it works. Okay, maybe um, I just want to make sure that the streaming is all working. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, maybe I'll just read a little bit, just as kind of a test. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'll read a little bit from, uh, hmm, well, Nature of the stars, that's kind of appropriate. Let's see here. Uh, Hello, everyone. Okay, let me uh, get a little feedback, make sure it's all working. So let's see. Let's see the stream quality. Hopefully it'll be okay. It's telling me, okay, cool. I see you have five viewers. Thanks for tuning in everybody. I'm really excited um, for today. So, um, we're not gonna start the interview for an hour. This is really just an early sound check. And, you know, but I appreciate everybody being around and, you know, um, feel free to post some questions. I think I'm gonna just for the next little bit here, I'm just gonna actually be reading from Ra's book on the fixed stars because it seems relevant. And that way um, it'll be a more thorough test I have 10 third lines, so I really like to test things out. And I want to make sure, for instance, that Zoom doesn't cancel out after 40 minutes or, you know, I want to make sure, um, make sure that that works and so on. Okay, I am going to find, I'll just be reading educational excerpts from Ra's material on the fixed stars as a little warm up. And if anyone has any questions or anything they'd like me to talk about just as a kind of warm up discussion or get the ball rolling or any ideas that have been bouncing around in your head related to true sidereal or just related to human design, um, please feel free. Rave Cosmology 7, The Nature of the Stars. Lesson 1, Aldebaran, The First Marker. I'm going to kind of skip through the intro here. Neutrinos are a star product. Poetically, Ra is saying here, he likes to talk about them as being the breath of the stars. 
but they are a star product. What we understand through human design is something that is incredibly magical. That is that this neutrino ocean is built on data streams and data streams that are sourced to all the stars in the heavens. There's no consciousness without them, though that may sound simple or banal, but they are consciousness. That is, they are the source of consciousness. I'm gonna make sure I don't read too much from this also because I understand, um, you know, legally speaking, it has to just be short excerpts. I mean, that's a great idea right off the bat that uh, neutrinos is the breath of stars. I really like that. All right. Audio is a bit choppy. Hmm. Let me... um, I'm going to do a couple of audio tests really quick, and then I'll be reading more. Oh, audio video isn't lagging. Check your connection. OK, good now? OK, good. Oh, enjoying my attire. Thank you. Yeah, I have my little, uh, you know, professorial, uh, you know, all I need is kind of bigger, bigger elbow pads. I'm even wearing my uh, slippers, very professorial. <laughs> in my, in my other life as an, you know, imaginary college professor, this is, this is how I would dress. So, okay. Um, yeah. As long as it's working, thank you so much. Thank you, Talis. Hi, Edible Angela. Hi, Divisor. Um, awesome. I'm just going to keep reading from Rave Cosmology then, just for more checking. All right. So now Ra continues. The stars have the deepest impact on our nodal position. And he's saying that his journey and the knowledge has led him to certain places of not just wonder, but a kind of respect. Um, yeah, it's interesting to think about respect, respect for the stars, respect for the nodes. The nodes, as an example, it is phenomenal how significant they are in our relative existence how they are the continuity actualized in our way of looking at things, that they are the continuity that binds the movement. It's through the nodes, those wonderful windows in the sky, that the most important information that we receive stellarly can be mapped. And Ra says here, he's seen so many attempts of doing interpretations of the stars, looking at the mapping, the relative relationship of somebody's sun to a particular star. And this is not what it's about. It's much more fascinating to look at those stars that are within the range of what are your design nodes. Much more interesting because this is alignment information. It's not about this, the proximity of the sun to a star or in astrology, the proximity of uh, the ascendant. It's about the nodes, particularly the design nodes. Most of the information that we receive from the stars is the way that we truly receive it. It's not that there isn't this ocean that we move through, but remember, we are a programmable entity with specific receptors that work in specific ways. The great influence of the stars in our life is only something that we can recognize ultimately through our own correctness, because where they have their deepest impact is in our nodal positioning, that is our design nodes, literally establishing the right direction for the movement of the individual vehicle, in this case, the individual object. So in thinking about looking at unique stars, there are so many. And Ron goes on to say he's a great fan of stars. And the very specific question that Ra is looking at here, he goes on to say, he's, he's asking if it is possible with the knowledge that he has to determine what the nature of a star actually is. In other words, is it possible to understand what the unique imprint of a star is? 
the unique recognizable imprint. I mean, this is something I've thought about too. How do you narrow down? I was really fascinated by the star Algol. Algol, because it's at 26 degrees Taurus, or at least it was at the time I was born. It probably still is. I mean, you know, 72 years to go a single degree, right? And um, so it's conjunct my ascendant. Now, of course, my ascendant is along the ecliptic. And, you know, the ecliptic is like this, and Algol was technically up here. So not really conjunct my ascendant if you look at, um, you know, the actual three-dimensional sky. But nevertheless, I was fascinated by Algol. I mean, I had a lot of synchronicities related to Medusa. Algol is kind of the third eye of Medusa. And a lot of it is about decapitation. It's known as Kaput Algol. And um, so I loved writers like Catherine Malibu and Jameson Webster and, and writers like that who would actually talk about Medusa symbolism. Uh, Julia Kristeva goes into it. And I, I kind of, you know, probably Michelle Serre. And I would kind of collect writers who explore Medusa and who explore horror and decapitation. And, you know, if you look at people where they have prominent algal positions, um, a lot of them are, you know, Will, will, will famously die in sort of grotesque ways and things like that. So I've been fascinated, you know, and just the fact that this star Algol is where we get the word ghoul. It's where we get the word alcohol. It's where we get the word ogre. In Chinese, it translates as pile of corpses. So we do have specific connotations to stars, inherited connotations. But I think what Ra is asking here is, how would he verify the quality of the star, not simply through, you know, folklore or mythos, but verifying it at a mechanical level, the mechanical neutrino stream of that star and what impact it has or what signposts you can look for as markers as that neutrino stream passes through the sheath of personality crystal bundles, which are the gates, which we call the gates, you know. We, we divide the personality crystal bundle sheath into these 64 divisions we call gates. And because the gate colors the neutrino stream so much, how do we know the quality of the star itself? And I think this is where Ra is quite brilliant once again. You know, it's 4323, uh, really has some genius here. And it's, it's in tracking the movement of the fixed stars against the gates. And that is, in fact, what Ra already had done with global cycles. But global cycles are rather tracking the movement of the gates that are attached to the fixed stars against the gates that are attached to the seasons, if you will, or tracking, you know, tracking the heavenly order against the earthly order, if we can borrow the terms from Chinese philosophy, the, the Ho Shu and the Lo Shu, or, or however they're called. Um, and so this is a little bit different. You know, Ra is not simply looking at two wheels moving against each other. He's looking at specific fixed stars that from our vantage point appear to move 72, sorry, one degree every 72 years. And then looking at that, he's able to kind of deconstruct some of the values of the stars. So I'm just gonna kind of move on towards that. Okay. Ra says, when he looks at the particular segment of the sky, at a given particular segment, he has a fascination with his poster girl. For Ra, he says, Aldebaran is sort of the poster girl, the Betty Grable of the Babylonians, the poster girl of the bull. And Ra says, when he thinks about it, it's clear to him that he cannot really attribute anything specific because the fact is that there's this enormous background field and not all of it is moving relative to us in the same way. It's not moving at the same speeds. I mean, there's this huge background field. It's hard to kind of differentiate Aldebaran from that background field. It depends on the distance and the relative relationship of any of these objects. We like our stellar objects on the ecliptic because it gives them a regularity. It gives us a way of being assured somehow that the cosmos is secure. But Ra says here that he looks out to see the endless density that is behind it. 
And it is all of that because every single one of those objects is producing data. It's an incredible thing to imagine. Every single one of those objects in the sky, the trillions upon trillions upon trillions upon trillions. Upon trillions, upon trillions. It's an endless, endless, endless number. And they're all pulsing out data and there is no awareness and there's no reason. It's their design, it's what they do. And the decay, which is the decay of their force, that decay is the consciousness data that pours out into the totality. And it doesn't just come from one direction, it pulses out in all directions, intertwines and meshes and molds and goes on forever, traveling at nearly the speed of light, this vast, dense, woven ocean of information. From all these different sources, and it has no agenda, and there's no awareness. It's a mechanical mechanism. What is an ocean of data with nothing to filter it? No matter how small you make the arc in the wheel, it's still an ocean of data. So where do we go with that, my delightful poster girl? Ra asks to Aldebaran. Because remember, this is in the context of Ra asking, can we discern the unique value or quality of a specific star, of a specific star of Aldebaran? Aldebaran Aleph. This is an indication of very specific, very important stars and their relationship to what is, our, what is our discussion for today. So first of all, the stars of the Pleiades and then the Hyades. And so, okay, he's kind of going on. Uh, I'm gonna skip through this. And then Aleph, Aldebaran was called the Aleph by the ancient Hebrew mystics. Ra says that most of the intelligent thought relative to our relationship to the sky began when the equinox was in Taurus, long before Aries was the first sign of the zodiac. So we're dealing with a beginning long ago in which the very early millenniums of developing this knowledge, the objects were in very different positions and they carried very different names and quality. So, I mean, at the time that Aldebaran was called Aleph, it had a very different quality because it was in such a different position relative to our earthly cycle. So that's interesting too, and something that I'm always kind of alert to when incorporating information um, from seven centered systems and ancient information and so on. You know, it's, it's funny because some sidereal astrologers would use the ancient qualities as evidence because it's been around for so many thousands of years. And I would use it as evidence of a description that was perhaps accurate then, but may not be accurate anymore because the positions have changed, the qualities have changed. So I think this is Ra's point here is that at that point, it made sense to call Aldebaran the Aleph because Aldebaran was in a position in the sky, perhaps during the spring equinox or something like that, that would give it prominence. So we're dealing with knowledge very long ago in which the early millenniums of developing this knowledge these objects were in very different positions and had very different names and qualities. One of the things to recognize about Aldebaran is that it was very important to the ancient astrologer. You know, I'm sure if we talk to Hellenistic astrologers like Chris Brennan or um, Jen Zart, you know, they would, they would know about Aldebaran and its ancient connotations as Aleph. Because it had its relative opposite, that is Antares on the other side of the wheel. And they basically formed the imaginary line upon which everything was calculated. So Antares and Aldebaran or Aleph were, were on this opposition. So Aldebaran being called the Aleph is something interesting. It's also interesting linguistically because the Sanskrit, it's the elephant, Aleph, the elephant, the alphabet. But anyway, it was certainly everybody's number one. And Ra says here that he calls it the first marker. For him, it's very clear that if we want to understand the quality that's coming from a certain arc in the wheel, then basically what we're looking at is a combination over a certain period of time in order to get a feel for it. And then the, I'll take a pause here, check any, um... oh, managing incoming questions. Wonderful, Edible Angela. Yes, absolutely. Please mod the manage the questions. I would, I would love that. Okay, the video audio is asynchronous again and way off. Um, let me go check the streamer and see what's going on here. 
Okay, one moment. I, I really want to figure out the audio. We have 45 minutes to get all the audio stuff figured out. So let me, let me do this. Okay, well, you know, I just checked in the streamer computer and it says that there's no dropped frames and it says it's in sync. So that might be something on the Zoom side. I unfortunately have not used Zoom a lot. The good news is I'm recording this in three different ways. And so at least one of them will hopefully have synchronized audio. I apologize um, if the audio isn't sync for this, it isn't in sync for the stream. Okay, it's way off too, dang. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have a 200 megabit business class connection and it says zero dropped frames and it says it's streaming. All I can think is that it's something weird in Zoom, that Zoom is, is not sending the audio and video um, in sync. So not really sure how to fix it. I'm, uh, I'm asking my friend to test right now as well. Leslie says, my south node is Taurus. Oh, <laughs> start a Google Live doc to post questions. Yes, that would be fantastic, Edible Angela. Please, that's wonderful. And I can post the link or you can post the link um, if it'll let you post it. There's also a Facebook group here. Um, so you're welcome to post the link in. There's the Facebook event group. Okay, I'm just gonna keep reading to do the sound check. And then I have my friend testing to see if, um, and you know, if the audio's still off, I'm not entirely sure what to do. There's a great solution that Kirill um, sent me using OBS Ninja, but you know, I, I think I um, didn't really get that set up in time. So I apologize for that. Okay, continuing on. The stars don't have specific values for people. And here Ross says, there's only one clue. As far as you can tell, there's only one clue. The Arabian stellar astrologers were really interesting. One of the things that was clear to them, that was very much a part of their revelation that emerged over the millennia was that the stars did not have specific values for people. This was misinterpreted a long time ago that the stars had a specific relationship to planets. And this is something Ross says that he thinks is deeply astute. Yeah, so this is interesting is that conventionally the stars are of qualities like, oh, such and such stars of the quality of Mars. And this other star is of the quality of Jupiter with Venus. And by kind of using the known planets as an alphabet to combine and recombine and juxtapose in different ways, the Arabic and you know, ancient you know, Arabian philosophers and, and mystics and, uh, and alchemists and so on were able to describe the stars given a particular vocabulary, a sort of astrological vocabulary. But what Ra is saying is that the connotations between a given star and a given planet are not actually fixed. And this is really fascinating. You know, I'm not sure that Ra says this specifically, but what I think is the case. And I believe he does say something along these lines, my understanding of it anyway, which is kind of an intuitive understanding, is that the quality of a given star, say Aldebaran, is not linked to a particular planet like Mars or Jupiter or Venus. It's actually dependent on what line, what line of the rave mandala that star currently occupies. And if it occupies a line for around 100 years, you know, for that 100 years, it will be associated with the planetary exaltations and detriments of that line. In other words, the planetary exaltations and detriments of that line in the Ray V. Ching will be the sort of arbiters of that neutrino stream on Earth. So that if Aldebaran happens to be in a line of gate 16 that has the moon and Mercury as the exaltations and detriments, then Aldebaran will essentially be active or be having some sort of active influence you know, of its neutrino stream 
carried out by the moon and Mercury. But when it goes into a line, and I believe this is what Ra says in this lecture, when it goes into a line of the I Ching that has neither exaltation nor detriment, then for all intents and purposes, that star is effectively gone from the Maya for that period of time. It, is, it does not have an impact on the Earth. So it's not the actual direct neutrino stream from the star that has a personal relationship or even a planetary relationship. It's rather the neutrino stream as it's been stepped down through the personality crystal bundle sheath that encompasses the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, a doc that anyone can edit just in case the chat gets heated and Jonah has his hands full. Wonderful. Leslie Winter says, I'll probably need to refer back to this YouTube a few times. According to NASA, I might be a Virgo instead of a Libra. Well, you might have been born under the constellation of Virgo. I mean, this, it's, this shouldn't really be a might about it unless it's right on the cusp because the constellations are not clearly demarcated when they begin and end. But if you were born in the sign of Libra, not the constellation of Libra, then it's very well possible that you were both born in Libra and Virgo, so to speak. You were born in the sign of Libra with the constellation of Virgo. Overhead. Um, switching to the Zoom. No, I haven't shared the Zoom link. I, I can, but I, I think it'll, I don't have Zoom Pro, so I think if more people join, it's not gonna let, let us talk more than 40 minutes. Yeah, you can use the FB event for the questions as well. I mean, I, I'm going to be checking both. So you're absolutely right, Talis. Um, you know, I'm, I'm intending to check the YouTube chat. I'm intending, you know, if you'd like to post um, the Google Doc, Edible Angela. I'm all about artifacts. So even just having a Google Doc as a sort of artifact of the questions is great. Um, and if anyone wants to transcribe Richard's answers to those questions and such, uh, you know, feel free. All right. I posted a fun um, link in the Facebook group too. It's called the 66 Sides and it shows various fixed stars and their position. So you can see Aldebaran in gate 16, for instance, and Algol in uh, what is it? gate eight in, in Taurus, which makes sense. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions in the Facebook group. I just thought I would, I would check really quick. Wonderful. Oh, that's a good question. I'm gonna save the questions for later. I don't wanna spoil them, but I did just copy a question uh, from Angela, which I think is a great question. And I hope to address later. Okay. Oh, I'm excited everyone's here. Thank you. Thanks all for coming. Um, I have my favorite glass here. This is a, uh, uh oh, is the audio not working? Hmm. Interesting. Looks kind of, uh, not really sure what's going on. Looks like the computer is having a hard time. Uh oh. Uh oh. Hmm. Completely frozen for me. Oh, Zoom. Okay, let's see what we got here. Let's see. Hmm. 
I just turned off my video and back on. Okay, it's working again. What the heck? Who would think this would be so? I, I apologize, Carol. Um, oh. Okay. Okay, let me see if I can fix it. Okay, well, I just checked on my phone and the audio is in sync, but I'm not really sure. Yeah, there is an option in OBS. I mean, OBS has no, like, OBS has no dropped frames and is using very little CPU and is totally in the green and says very good connection and everything's perfect. So it must be Zoom. Um, Zoom must be messing it up somehow because of the way that Zoom is being streamed into OBS is all I can figure. When I checked on my phone, it was in sync. So I really don't know why some people are getting it off. Um, I will just stop and restart the stream and see if that fixes it, I guess. Oh, good point. Okay, Carol, Carol has the answer. Okay, I'm gonna stop at the stream. I'll be back in uh, five minutes. Okay. I'm going to do that. I'll be back in five minutes, everybody. Just one moment. All right, let's try this now. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Let's see how it goes now. I'm doing a direct stream to YouTube. One second delay, dang, that's not good. Mm. Okay. Uh, now I got the title wrong. I'm going to change the title. Oh my God. Okay, one more second. God damn it. Million things.
All righty. Let's see how this works now. The fifth time's the charm. Is that is that what how the saying goes, or is it the eighth time is the charm? Okay. All right. Okay, where is the live stream? So I'm just updating the stream, updating the tags, and let's see. Okay. Okay, let's see if this works now. Stream health, excellent. Stream is healthy, looking good. Okay, I'm going to my channel. Let's see what happens. Okay, new link. Dang, I think we lost everyone from the, the old chat. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm posting the link around. Um, hopefully this is better now, I really. <laughs> ah, okay. Sweet. Okay, I just posted. Uh, I just posted some of the links around, so hopefully people will find their way back. I apologize for that. Thank you, Carol, for the solution. Um, Carol also made the awesome, the awesome opposition flyer for this that I that I really like. A deeper investigation into true sidereal human design. Okay, so just continuing on a little bit. Um, I think this will be good for the testing. Stars don't have specific values for people. I think there's only one clue. That's what Ross says. Hmm. The Arabian stellar astrologers were really interesting. One of the things that was clear to them it was very much a part of their revelation and emerged over the millennia was that for them, stars didn't have specific values for people. This was misinterpreted a long time ago, that stars had a specific relationship to the planets. But they were looking at the way in which certain stars and their relationship with certain planets were imprinting, in our language, imprinting through the planetary filter. And these planetary filters were important. The relationship with the planets being a filter is something that's important in order to be able to understand some kind of unique relationship that we can attribute to the star itself. And that's the key. In other words, going through this process, it's interesting to know the mythology, but Ra says here, what he's really looking for is why have these stars always been important? That's where all this starts with in terms of intellectual pursuit. 
If we have this ocean of information, what gives these stars their particular importance? Why are they different? When we look at the Babylonians, who are really the founders of planetary astrology, the first masters of planetary astrology, for them, that wasn't the point. The point was that the planets were the main instruments of impacting us, in our language, imprinting us. And if you take these two together, you have a gateway to understanding a peculiar aspect in that star. So kind of moving forward, the cycle of Aldebaran. Ra says, here we have perhaps the two most famous female constellations, the seven sisters of the Pleiades and the seven sisters of the Hyades. Here they are all together. And there's an image that's shown dealing in the quarter of civilization in the yin zone, in a zone that's relative to a time frame. And in this particular, um, particular illustration, you can see that what is an evolutionary movement or a, a movement mapping the position of Aldebaran. So what this image is showing is where the star Aldebaran appeared to move. I mean, it, it, it's essentially where, what line it moved into. So in 1600, Aldebaran was in the sixth line of gate 20. In 1700, it was in the first line of gate 16. And by 1800, it was in the third line of gate 16. And 1900, it was in the fourth line of gate 16. And in 2000, it was in the fifth line of gate 16. So Aldebaran has moved through this gate of skills, this logical gate of skilled work. And Ra says here, he would love to look at the color information of the stars beneath the line. Here, he's just looking at the line, which is already fascinating in its own way, but to be able to get to the precision of looking at the color underneath the line would be quite something. And Ra says here, basically what I'm looking at when I'm looking at a cycle, and the only, it's the only way you can begin to grasp what the particular impact of a star may be in its movements, what its responsibilities are, what it brings out, what it gives rise to in specific eras. It's basically, um, and so Ra says, there's a complexity that arises out of that. And he talks about the quarter by quarter program, the fantastic journey that's looking at the influence of crystal bundles, the influence of the crystal bundle shell on the way our personality consciousness is impacted. And these bundles, which are known technically in the cosmology as the, the faces, these are the faces of the Godhead. And you can see that in each of the particular quarters, it gives you information about what kind of information system it is. And there are also two very, very female forces that rule these eight hexagrams that are part of the quarter civilization, each quarter being made up of 16 hexagrams. So Aldebaran's impact on the cross of planning. So what we're looking at here is a movement. The movement of the 16th gate took place somewhere in the middle of the 17th century. So in fact, we're looking at the 16th gate, cross of planning gate, so Aldebaran, therefore, has a deep impact in the cross of planning and has been having a deep impact. We'll take a look at what the possibilities are, but a deep impact since the beginning of this cycle. It entered the 16th gate somewhere in the middle of the 17th century, so in the 1650s, say, and it's been there ever since. And it's going to be there when we end the cycle. So it's interesting to see that Aldebaran, you know, and so on, these are my words now, is kind of related in this way that Aldebaran has relevance to our time because of it being in a gate that is part of the global cycle of the time. So Aldebaran takes on special significance starting in the 1650s. And the basis of the cross, cross of planning, uh, the 40th gate, 37th gate, 16th gate, the 19th gate. And in just looking at the 16th gate, we have the gate of enthusiasm, which we know is a gate of skills, part of a logical channel, part of a logical stream, the gate of experimentation. And here's Ross speaking. It's clear that in looking at the success of the cross of planning, that the great success of the cross of planning has been the development of technologies. And from the middle of the 17th century onward, we've been in the grip of the industrial revolution in the technolo technological revolution and on and on and on, rooted in experimentation. So he's talking about 
you know, and why it's relevant. There's no 16-2 in the list, but in 1700, we see the theme of the 16-1. By 1800, we have the theme of the 16-3. 1900, we have the theme of the 16-4, and by 2000, it's the 16-5. So we're seeing, and this is Ra's words, a particular data stream, a data stream that is moving along, and it's a data stream that has its own consistency, one would assume. That's why we keep on referring to it as algebra. But this consistency is impacting different lines. And Ra's talking about how it impacts through the fixings and the I Ching and so on. Oh no, the live chat doesn't save his comments. Okay, good. Good call. We should save it to. Um... Yeah, uh, I yeah, it looks like the comments were lost. So, thank you for noticing that, Edible Angela. And if you would like to um, save any of the comments, uh, you know, or it might just be that the comments in the previous stream only appear at the timestamp. I'm not really sure how it works. I haven't used Google Live too much. Okay, 15 minutes, 17 minutes to our interview. I'm gonna have a little more water. Just give a shout out to one of my favorite uh, companies. This is Commemorative Glass by Holy Mountain Brewing. This is their logo. And, uh, and then it has the little, the little guy from Twin Peaks on there. It's a Twin Peaks Holy Mountain mashup. I'm not affiliated with them in any way. I just love their beer. And um, this is one of my favorite cups. So <laughs> it's a fun one. For coffee mugs, I'm partial to um, milk glass. I really like particularly the jadeite milk glass that you find with anchor hawking from the 50s, stuff like that. So. All right. So Ra continues. I skipped over a few pages, but he says, Aldebaran, the mother of science. If you look at Aldebaran in the beginning of the 1600s, before we're going to have that shift in the middle of the 1600s, and here is Aldebaran influencing our wisdom. Here's the Aleph where our wisdom began in terms of our exploration of the value of the heavens. Aldebaran, that's what it represents. It drives our fascination with the universe. And if you look at the nature of Aldebaran, being as an example in the 16th gate, the way the 16th gate operates in terms of scientific development and across the planning, Aldebaran points us to the sky. It is in this era that we have the real development of the telescope, and that we can travel into the heavens, a technological movement along that line. And Ra says, for him, Aldebaran begins with begins what we now call physics. Aldebaran is the mother of all physicists and the mother of all metaphysicians. And this is where Ra says he sees that it carries one of its values. It also carries with it something else because it brings out the quality inherent within it in its mercurial themes. It becomes fascinating to begin a process of deconstruction of what the movement of Aldebaran really is by analyzing each of its steps along the way. And the difference ultimately between the way Mercury is going to impact and the way the moon is going to impact and what the difference is going to be. And if you happen to have your moon there or your Mercury there, and if it's going to be conjunct Aldebaran, particularly of those of you who would be able to conjunct Aldebaran with the moon in this era now, there you will see the most powerful impact of that star and that being's life. So it's interesting. So, you know, Ra kind of starts by talking about the relationship of the stars to the nodes and then how difficult it is to have a personal relationship to the star. And then kind of goes on to say, you can have a personal relationship to the star, but it's under the very specific conditions and to really get precise with it, to notice how that star moves through particular lines in a particular era and inflects those lines with a certain quality or even operates through particular planets based on the exaltations and detriments of those lines. 
So as Aldebaran's moving through lines that have the moon and Mercury in exaltation and detriment, it's essentially indicating a connection between Aldebaran and the moon and Mercury at that time. And people born with moon or Mercury in those positions will actually have the deepest impact. That is to say, perhaps the most fascination with the sky. I mean, it'd be interesting to look at Neil deGrasse Tyson and these sort of famous astrologers or astrophysicists or look at Stephen Hawking or people and to see where Aldebaran is in their chart and to see if they had a moon or Mercury placement or a design node placement that connects them to Aldebaran. That would be quite an interesting exercise. All right, we have 10 minutes. I'm gonna have a little more water and I'm gonna get ready and um, I'll be back shortly. So looking forward to it.
Oh, geez, is it still out of sync? Okay. Sorry about that, Thomas. Um, hey, Jenny, good to see you. Yeah, I don't know what's up with the sync. Um, I'll try to get it working next time. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, I'm gonna shoot Richard a message and see if you'd like to join anytime. Excellent. Okay, well, it looks like restream wasn't the problem. Oh, it is better, sand rings. Okay, I'm good. Yeah, I guess it doesn't really matter that much. Sorry about that, everyone. I am recording, so I'm hoping that the actual recording will be in sync uh, from Zoom and that I'll be able to upload that as a separate, separate file. So. All right. Seven minutes to go. Excellent. I'll just, uh, I'll just read a little more just, just while we're waiting. The Human Design Global Survey and Star Alignments. Ra says here, he looks forward to any kind of distilling that his students do relative to this information. There's no way that he is going to be able to do more than give a surface view of the particular stars. So yeah, it's, I mean, this is a very like, you know, one of my kind of key talking points throughout the whole true sidereal has been um, that of metaphor of that, you know, people saying something like true sidereal is showing us the unconscious. Well, that's just a metaphor for the design or saying that it's a new form of consciousness. Well, that's a metaphor for right variable consciousness or for the nine centered being, you know. And similarly, I think that the great interest in sidereal is because it is itself a very rich area of interest. I mean, in a way, it is a metaphor for our shifting global cycle. People who think they're interested in true sidereal human design might really be interested in the global cycles. They just haven't heard of the global cycles, right? Th that kind of thing. And so I feel like with this game of telephone where you get farther and farther from the point of mutation, things become more and more figurative or going the other way, more and more concrete. And there are various reifications to borrow the term from sociology, you know, various concretizations of certain abstract concepts like the nine centered being, like the coming mutation of the rave, you know, um, and the mutation in the solar plexus, like the changing global cycles and stuff like this. And that all of this information, which is so relevant to us as human beings alive right now on this planet, you know, people sense the value in that information, but they're just not close to the information. So two or three or four or 10 steps removed, it turns into the age of Aquarius, or it turns into the return of the divine feminine. When the divine feminine is kind of metaphorical for the yin, for the form principle and for the understanding of design. So I guess I'm saying if you're right there at kind of front row seats at the mutation, which is human design, then you get the direct information and if you're farther away, you get metaphors or var various reifications of that information. So you have people that are nevertheless, they have a valid interest. I mean, the interest is absolutely valid, the interest in sidereal. I'm just saying that people who think they might be interested in a true sidereal chart may actually be interested in global cycles without realizing it. People who think they're interested in a chart that ostensibly shows them a design of their unconscious may actually be more interested in looking at simply the design side of their human design chart 
which is already a map of the unconscious. Or if they're astrologers, they might be interested in running an astrological natal chart for their design date, you know, by looking at the position of the sun 88 degrees before birth and, and, and casting a chart for that. So I guess I'm just saying, you know, um, I understand why this is a hot topic. It's a hot topic because it's at least metaphorically relevant to the mutations going on, the emergence of the nine centered being, the emergence of right variable consciousness, the emergence of the rave, which has not yet happened. You know, the understanding uh, that we have uh, two souls, so to speak, you know, the personality crystal and the design crystal and these kind of burgeoning understandings that take a long time to permeate consciousness. And as they get farther and farther away from the source of the information become more and more metaphorical or kind of like Google Translate, you know, there was this great app called Translate Party where you could uh, translate a phrase between English to Japanese back to English to Japanese again over and over. And it would start with, you know, um, to be or not to be, that is the question. And it would end with, being questions is something that beings don't do or something, you know, it completely changes. It's a game of telephone. And that's kind of what it's like here, where we have these concepts in human design of the yin, of the design form, the design principle, of the sort of holistic, of the, the burgeoning right variable consciousness and solar plexus ceasing to be a motor and becoming an awareness center. Not for us, of course, everyone alive today is still susceptible to the wave but you know we have these these concepts in the human design cosmology or of the uh the movement of the global cycles and so on and the end of the cross of planning and beginning of the sleeping phoenix and i just feel like the validity i mean there's different levels of validity and the interest in sidereal astrology is absolutely valid as an interest in our place in the greater cosmos right? It's just about the proximity to the information. And it's about what happens to information when it moves farther and farther and farther from that mutative source. Right? I'm sure every major religion was founded with a mutative encounter. And yet, as you move farther from the mutative source, you get, you know, misunderstandings of what was meant and so on. All right, one minute to go. I'm going to make sure that Richard is able to connect. Uh, he says he will be right there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Heretical Investigation. Glad that the stream seems stable and sync is much better. Uh, Sandring said, whatever I did, fix it. Well, you know, that's 100% Carol. So we have Carol to thank for that. He, uh, he noticed that I was using Restream to multicast between YouTube and Facebook and said, hey, you know, why don't you just take that out of the equation and just stream directly to YouTube? And that's what I did. So that's great. <laughs> Are you streaming to Insta or is three too many? You know, I would stream to Insta. I just don't think I would get um, the audio from Richard on Insta. Oh, wonderful. Share the link to the HD Interactive with Doc. Okay, I don't see the link, Angela. Is that back on Facebook? A Sleeping Phoenix, aged 59 in the year 2027. Um, you know, I think uh, when 2027 hits, the Sleeping Phoenixes are gonna be much more in demand. I'll put it that way. I have uh, three activations of the first line of gate nine, which is the key to gate 10 right now during our um, cross of planning. And so, you know, the, the key to um, right, right now, my, my gate nine is effectively the key to understanding uh, the behavior of the self and self-love and stuff like that. And in 2027, I become irrelevant and the sleeping phoenixes can take over. So I would say, what happens in 2027? Uh, start a YouTube channel. Uh, Sean, are we taking a guest today? Absolutely, yes. So I'm just waiting for Richard to join. He just messaged me that he will be joining momentarily. Angela, I think your link is getting um, eaten 
my YouTube. So let me grab it off of Facebook. Can you um, send it to me on Facebook maybe or just refreshed? Let's see. I think I can post it, but it's, yeah, it's not a, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was being a little bit f facetious, Leslie, but the idea is basically that the cross of the sleeping phoenix, um, along with anyone who has six lines in their chart or is a six line profile, is essentially going to possess or already possesses the keys for the next era. And what those keys open, you have to look at the lock and key material. For instance, um, you know, those who have gate 61 right now have one of the keys to understanding, particularly line one of gate 61, and the keys to understanding um, our collective history, which is in gate 13, right? And gate 13 is a perennial lock. Right now, gate 61 is in the first line of the global cycle. So people who carry the first line of gate 61, like Ra did, which is occult knowledge, are able to interpret human history through that occult knowledge. Um, someone who carries gate 34, line six, will have the key to the next era. So yeah, no one is ever irrelevant. I know I was being a little bit facetious. So, and besides that, after 2027, people will start to be born with the new energy, but I don't think a lot of babies are going to be, you know, having a lot to say. So it's really going to take many years. I mean, I imagine at least until 2034 that we start to see seven and eight year olds who are able to express their, you know, to communicate some of their, their, their difference in opinion. And then of course, you know, when we get to 2040s and 2050s, we're going to be seeing adults who actually carry this new frequency, this sixth line frequency, but everyone alive today will continue carrying the cross of planning frequency and will continue, you know, having this sort of background frequency of the part seeking the whole, and we're all in this together and let's all help each other out and all that tribal goodness. So yeah, um, the lock and key material is absolutely fascinating, Leslie. It's it's incredible, and I'd like to do more videos on it. I have a couple on YouTube, but they're from live recordings, and the audio is not very good. So I'm really hoping to do some more um, with you know a nice mic like this. So. Okay, let's make sure. <laughs> We talk a lot about the sleeping phoenix, but what about the cross of penetration? So yeah, well, it's an interesting one. The masters of the surface, the masters of the pen prick. All right, Richard is here. Wonderful. Admitting now. Hello, welcome. Hello, do you have any audio, Richard? It says it's connecting, so you may need a moment. Hey, what's up? Hey, not a lot. Just been uh, working out a couple of <laughs> technical difficulties. Can you can you hear me okay, by the way? Oh, yeah, um, it's coming through great. And, okay, uh, awesome. Yeah, and uh, oh, <laughs> we have a chat going in YouTube as well. Um, so <laughs> comments and well great to connect great to put a face to a name yeah man um i'm happy to be here and uh talk about some human design <laughs> excellent excellent yeah i thought um for a nice format today we could just kind of start talking a little bit about our backgrounds your background in particular i'm, I'm curious to know um you know, I, I checked out your Facebook page and such, and I see you're also a software developer like me. So we're, we're a couple. Oh, of, really? <laughs> yeah. A um, couple programmers who like to geek out on the stars. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I thought for format, it would be nice to just kind of allow you to take, uh, to take the lead for, <laughs> excuse me, for presenting some of the information that you've been researching and your kind of original research and your conclusions. And, you know, if, if you'd like my feedback during any of that, you can always pause for a moment and say, Jonah, what do you think about this? Or if you encountered that before, but I'm also totally happy to just kind of 
lay it out. I know that I have a couple questions. My questions are actually very technical. I'm much more curious about, you know, number of degrees used and things like that. So we can maybe go into that after. So we have more context just at, at that time. And then um, we're, we also have a Google Doc going that I haven't looked at yet, but it's, um, we have Angela kind of moderating questions in the chat. So uh, she'll, be, <laughs> she'll be coming up with some questions in the doc there. <laughs> okay. Uh, cool. Um, yeah, so I can just, uh, I guess, uh, tell you a bit uh, about my background real quick. Um, so, uh, yeah, I um, studied philosophy at Yale. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do, really. Uh, <laughs> still, never did figure that out. Um, so, uh, you know, I kind of just wanted to major in everything, I guess. Um, and yeah, uh, kind of tried out um, a bunch of different things. Like, I tried going to med school. That didn't work out. I um, Tried, I tried, you know, get, going to school to get a PhD, um, <laughs> you know, into like some neuroscience or psychology and stuff. I've, I've always been interested in psychology and stuff like that. Um, you know, uh, Myers-Briggs and, and all that. I saw you had a, several of those types of videos on your YouTube. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, um, it's been, a, it's been yeah. a passion of mine. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so... Yeah, and then I started programming a couple of years ago, and actually did like that uh, as a career for once. So, um, uh, so yeah, uh, that's what I've been doing for a couple of years now, and uh, I eventually got uh, hired at the Home Depot to be a data engineer, mm. um, which, uh, but you know, I quit that job actually earlier last year like it was real crazy how everything just seemed to line up um like right at the start of the like, coronavirus and everything and uh um you know so uh and that's really when i started um uh thinking a lot about this human design stuff that um that i've come up with uh i actually only discovered human design um in uh like it's been almost like a year and a half ago now so it's really not been that long at all compared to some of you guys i know who've been in it for quite a while um <laughs> i mean i'm i'm a relative newcomer i i encountered human design in 2006 but it wasn't until nine years later that I kind of mark um, the date that I entered into the experiment, so to speak. So, because, you know, there's a difference between an intellectual curiosity and uh, let's try it out, you know, let's really, let's really get down to it. But, but yeah, I mean, there are people, I mean, who have been there since the beginning. It's kind of, um, it's, it's really a special thing what we have on Facebook now and people like Genoa Blivin and people who kind of, uh, you know, Alok Anand Diaz who are there since the beginning. And it's, it's kind of nice to, to have them. Mm -hmm chime in every once in a while to come out of their manifester caves and uh, <laughs> and comment a little bit. And I don't know if you saw, but Genoa did in fact comment on, on your work, which I thought was pretty cool. I mean, that that in itself is an accomplishment to get uh, <laughs> to get him to kind of, you know, he lives in Santa Fe as far as I know, and we have some mutual friends, but despite my best attempts for the past couple of years, I haven't been able to even, you know, grab a coffee. So, uh, <laughs> so good on you for at least, um, provoking a reaction and and quite a reaction it's been uh it's been it's been a journey right <laughs> through this uh, through a number of reactions so yeah so so when did this so when did true sidereal start for you then i mean when so you kind of did human design you know a couple of years ago you're researching it studying it and i've seen you have some background in astrology and other modalities when yeah. did you first kind of come up with or present uh, your research on true sidereal, if you wanna talk about how that came about. Yeah, um, and yeah, I just wanna say that I, uh, from the moment I stumbled upon human design, it was actually on amazon.com, you know, searching through books, believe it or not, you know, I was just like blown completely away that I'd never heard of it before. And it seemed to be what I'd always been looking for my whole life. Um, you know, some kind of, you know, ultimate system that incorporates all these different things, right? Um, and so, and especially with me having, uh, 
you know, studied philosophy, I thought I'd already, you know, been exposed to like every kind of like intellectual um, philosophical view that was out there. But uh, so yeah, I was I was doubly blown away, you know, because, um, uh, you know, I never heard of this somehow. <laughs> mm. And uh, so I from the moment I discovered it, I I took it incredibly seriously and, you know, um, wanted to, to figure out, do the experiment, figure out how everything fit uh, into my life, all that. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't that I was like a doubting it um, at all, uh, or was looking to uh, like come up with a, you know, a, a modification of it. Um, uh, it so the true serial stuff uh, started um, uh, last year around September or so, and it started because um, of my actually true serial birth chart. That's what kind of flipped the switch and uh, got and, and that's like what you would find on masteringthezodiac.com or one of those sites. And you're not affiliated with them. You're just using a similar, uh, similar no, research I'm, program, or no, I'm not affiliated with them. But um, uh, you know, uh, as soon as I did discover that particular site, MasteringTheZodiac.com, which, by the way, is is really the only site um, or people I know of who are really working with true serial astrology. So it's kind of an accident I even discovered it. In fact, I hadn't even heard of sidereal astrology, much less true sidereal astrology, but it was a friend of mine um, who had been, who, his name is uh, Jaron Kenyon, who's been in the human design community for a while. I don't know, some of you guys probably know him, but he's kind of doing like this life coaching with me, right? And we were working with the human design stuff a lot. And, uh, you know, just one day we happened to be talking about, he was talking about sidereal astrology and his success with it, especially the Vedic stuff, you know, how accurate it was. And, uh, you know, I just, I asked him kind of just casually, you know, like, well, you know, wouldn't that make your planets and human design change also if you happen to use that astrology as your, you know, instead of tropical astrology? Um, and he said, no, uh, he said, no, 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 you know, they wouldn't change, you know, and, uh, he said that, you know, that's why he'd always heard from everyone uh, who had been in the human design community. But, you know, the next week after I thought about it a little bit, you know, and kind of really thought about it, you know, I was like, well, why wouldn't they change? Um, and uh, kind of confronted him with the argument that, okay, in my true sidereal birth chart, my son's sign is different, right? Um, I'm a Gemini instead of a Cancer, which I am in Western astrology. So the hexagrams, you know, are correlated with the astrological signs. In standard human design, I'm a 62 for my main sun gate, which is in Cancer, right? Um, but if my son, if my sun gate were in Gemini, you know, then surely my the the hexagram would have to change as well. Uh, so that was kind of the reasoning, basic reasoning behind that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh i kind of just kind of went with that idea of you know curiosity just to kind of see what well happen. and so i guess my i mean I, I definitely am curious um so then following so moving the the hexagrams now do the hexagrams change widths if width is the correct term or is it just kind of they all just rotate i mean yeah, um, I I thought when I was first contemplating it, I I thought about the problem with them perhaps changing width or not, but uh, my reasoning for them not, and I think it's supported by some uh, statistics that I'll go into, is that um, you know each hexagram represents an, an equal aspect of the personality, you know, so you know why should they be different sizes? Yeah, and I mean, I mean, I think that's even more. Um, it gets even more tricky and messy when you get into colors and tones and all the way to bases, because at that point, 
if you're going, I mean, I know that um, for some sidereal astrologers, I, I believe mastering the zodiac has, I actually am not sure, maybe you can clarify whether they have variable width signs, but I know that some sidereal astrologers will make Scorpio, you know, eight degrees and will make Ophiuchus, the rest of it, or things like that. And that seems much easier to do in astrology when you're not dealing with such granularity. In human design, you're literally dealing with, you know, 10,000 uh, tones and 60,000 bases and so on. And so at the level of precision, uh, it just seems like it'd be much harder to do, you know, much harder to actually calculate. So, okay, um, please, I, I, I do have questions. I would love to just kind of hear your journey of like, what was, like, what were the first steps? Did, did you start writing code? Did you start with pen and paper? Like, how did it kind of emerge? Yeah, so the first thing I did was, um, uh, you know, do a lot of research and reading on uh, different human design things and, and things that Rod said, uh, because um, in, in, in this kind of experiment I was doing to kind of uh, replace tropical astrology with true sidereal astrology, you know, and, that, and by the way, that's really all that I've done even now is just simply substitute those astrological systems. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and and that's that's all that's really that's and kept everything else intact but just yeah, kind of I haven't moved worried about so basically like all the channels are the same and all of the gates are in the same positions yeah. and everything it's really just a question of which gate is activated or not by the right. neutrino stream and so on okay right. yeah. yeah i got you um so as i was contemplating how i was gonna uh, do that um i needed to uh figure out um uh you know how the wheels would rotate um and why uh because that's the main difference in the astrology is there's a rotation in the wheel um and uh, uh you know the constellations change size and number two but honestly those don't really affect it's just kind of a visual thing. It doesn't really affect the calculation when you go into it. So it's mainly that rotation, um, which changes uh, the orientation of the hexagrams like to space. Um, and I'll go into more on that later, but uh, basically I need to know the starting point of the wheel, um, the starting starting point, you know? Mm -hmm. And I read um, uh, something by Ra, you know, that uh, in the, line companion his line companion work uh that talks about gate uh 25 um you know kind of being the the starting and ending point for the entire wheel uh he calls it the alpha and the omega um because it uh you know it's it's the gate of innocence the spirit of the self so it kind of represents the uh um you know the fool like tarot card you know the beginning of the journey and uh he says you know it comes after gate 36 which he refers to as the experience that we're kind of there to get and we pass through that and then we start over at gate 25 which and and just just to interrupt for one moment isn't um just to clarify and also for the viewers is gate 25 on the spring equinox in the tropical zodiac is that the one that's always at the spring at the yes. at the zero Aries vernal. Okay, just just so we're all on the same page. In the tropical zodiac, right? That's where right. twenty five is. Okay, um, I wasn't sure, but I wanted to confirm. Right. So that would also be, a, I guess, a justification for it being the start as well. I um, just was, I mean, kind of a conventional place, you know, zero Aries, whatever. But okay. Yeah. And yeah, I, yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, um, but I needed to know like the precise degree, like not just. Uh, zero degrees Aries, because that doesn't really tell you anything. Um, uh, so, um, because actually when you look at it, gate 25 starts in Pisces, um, actually. Right, it's the second line that's in the zero, because all of the second lines are the, yeah, I got you. Um, yeah, because the whole theme of gate 25 starting at the end, you know, and, and all that, uh, mm -hmm. so. So I had to, um, so I kind of took that as the zero point uh, for the entire wheel and um, shifted, rotated that point by the amount of degrees that the true sidereal astrology differs from the tropical zodiac. 
-hmm. which is about 31 degrees. Um, okay. And, uh, so hmm. that, that was, and then everything else was of course rotated the same amount. Um, but it doesn't now I generated a chart on mastering the Zodiac and one of my placements was 26 degrees off. Does mastering the Zodiac have a, has a variable sign width, or is there something unusual about that? That would cause it to be a discrepancy between the 31 versus the 26. Um, uh, so, so it's about the Iana Masa that is being used, which the Iana Masa, as you probably know, is the uh, like the kind of num number that astrologers use to offset for precession. Um, so I was using the number that the guy officially, you know, said he uses in his astrology program. Okay, so maybe if I generated a chart on mastering the zodiac that looked like it was 26 degrees off, it may have actually been 31 degrees off, but they may have modified the widths of the signs or something else. So it kind of yeah. threw me off because I see that I had a Virgo degree. You know, I'm born two degrees Libra and Western, and I was something like eight degrees Virgo and mastering the zodiac. And so that's not 31. It's I would right. be one degree Virgo and mastering the zodiac.com. So, but I guess it's because they're not yeah. only modifying by 31, they're also oh. modifying the widths of the signs. Is that well, right? Um, so, so, uh, so the reason for that is, um, um, yeah, so there, there's like, um, it, it, it appears to be 26 degrees. Um, if you, um, I don't know how to say it exactly, but uh, there's like another like four or five degrees you have to add on, um, uh, you know, for for all these astrological reasons that make it. I see. So out. if I just kind of go to mastering the zodiac and make a chart, it's not really going to give me the full true sidereal. It's going to give me a certain modification, but not the entire. I just have in at least in Western in my conventional human design, I have uh, Gate sixty four, the Gate of Confusion, and I. I don't have 47, so I don't have much to do with the confusion. So I find myself going, this was confusing to me. You know, how do I reconcile the 26 and the 31 and so on? But I, I don't want to get derailed into the weeds, although I think as well, we actually have on, some, some pictures yeah. of all the different wheels and comparisons that we can look at in a minute. And oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Clarify things. I'm, yeah, I'm a very visual thinker too. So yeah. I, love, I love to see it. I, I, in dealing with this stuff, you know, I, I think it's kind of impossible to think about correctly without you know, mm -hmm. visualizing it with, you know, images and stuff, you know, just so many mm -hmm. things. Okay. So, but I didn't mean to derail. So, th so you have the 31 degrees approximately offset, mm -hmm. and then you kind of start gate 25, 31 degrees earlier. I mean, it really, you could start any gate because the gates are all equidistant. You're basically, it's just, it's just two wheels and the wheel is shifted back 31, right? Well, um, Yes. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, you're right. It, um, I mean, 25 is a nice poetic starting point, but I guess what I'm trying to say is really for our purposes, um, we're just shifting the entire wheel by a fixed number of degrees, approximately 31, and then just kind of seeing what, where the placements fall. Yes. Well, because the way I did it at first to make sure I was doing it correctly was, um, you know, I kind of did them one at a time, like, like the astrological wheel and then the, the hexagram wheel uh to to make sure they were like lining up right um so um but yeah now that i look at it it's just a simple rotation uh, mm -hmm. of the wheel got it um see because there's the also there's the question you know why why would the hexagram wheel rotate with the zodiac wheel that's not necessarily like obvious right uh like be, and especially according to human design because the hexagram hexagrams are aligned by definition supposedly with the equinoxes and solstices uh you know like the 25 10 15 the gates of love or whatever mm -hmm. So, the you know, sphinx, so the exact midpoint the sphinx yeah. the, you know, uh, neptune's trident you know, <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's kind of like the problem that, you know, how can those gates be changing like, you know, ever? Uh, um, well, uh, yeah, and it depends, I guess, what we mean by Zodiac. If we mean a dressing system, you know, on the ecliptic or if we mean the constellations. 
And then, and maybe we'll get into that a little bit later. I'd like to talk about the constellations and also about the fixed stars, because, <laughs> you know, my immediate question, whenever I hear about the constellations is, can we get even more precise? Can we find the value of a particular fixed star and so on? And so yeah. <laughs> since that's what constellations are, right, is a field of stars. So, mm -hmm. uh, but okay, so, okay, so just to kind of set the narrative so far. So using the 31 degree modification of true sidereal, the wheel, approximately 31 degrees, the wheel shifts and, you know, you now have this new chart. Everything else stays the same. Um, so tell me more about what, what happened next, you know, what, what, once you did this. Yeah. Yeah. So I think now might be a good time to uh, show you this, this little PowerPoint I put together with, with those comparisons, just so we can um, like visualize that. Uh, that would so be fantastic. I'm going to share my screen uh, really quick. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, it said host disabled participant screen. Oh, show. no, I'll definitely <laughs> enable you. I can make you yeah. <laughs> more. Um, make, I'll just make you a host. There you go. Okay. Uh, there we are. All right. Cool. Mm. Okay, tell me if you're seeing this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Brief highlights yeah. of true sidereal, aka cosmic human design. And I see today uh, tropical, Fagan Bradley, and true sidereal. Yeah, so this is the uh, Prometheus astrological program that uh, I mean, a lot of people use, but that site, Master of the Zodiac, also uses and where I discovered it. So it has lots of options for configuring all these things. So, yeah, these are the different wheels for these different systems, uh, what they look like. Um, so, according to tropical astrology, you know, today the sun is in Pisces. Um, uh, according to Fagan Bradley, which is a variant of, of sidereal astrology, uh, the sun is in Aquarius. And, you know, that's also where true sidereal says it is, but there's. Uh, you know, is, still, is that because the Fagan Bradley is approximately it's 22 degrees and change It's almost 23 degrees exactly offset, but then a true sidereal is around 31 so we can see yeah the 13 versus the six so there's an extra six degrees and change between the two. But yeah, which, is, and, which would actually put it at 29 but. Is true and, sidereal, but the, okay, so, but true sidereal is changing the widths of the signs. Cause I see that true sidereal has Ophiuchus, Sagittarius right. is much larger. So, okay, I understand now. It was confusing for a moment because I was thinking, why does it only 29 degrees different? But it's actually, it, it is the full 31. It's just because the widths of some of the signs. Yeah, that yeah. Uh, like messes with the count, you know, if you're changing that. I got it. So, okay. yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the Fagan Bradley um, and the other sidereal uh, systems, um, it's like somewhat agree, but they're all slightly different because they all are using slightly different offsets. Um, but in my opinion, uh, none of them actually do what true sidereal astrology does, which is actually try explicitly to depict the planets as they are, as they appear in the sky, like wind being viewed from the ground, you know? So that's kind of the idea behind uh, true sidereal, um, is mm -hmm. that astrology should represent the celestial objects as they appear to us on earth, uh, viewing them. Uh, so, um, and if we look at, uh, like, you know, I use one of those sky viewing apps uh, today at the bottom here, you can see um, just looking at the sky. So, you know, the sun right here is in about the center of Aquarius. So this is the constellation Aquarius and there's mm -hmm. the sun that's actually looking at the sky, mm -hmm. and, uh, just looking at it. Um, it's in the constellation, the constellation of Aquarius. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, you know, there's Capricorn uh, for reference there. So. And is it okay? 
Yeah. And I guess I just have a couple of comments. I mean, I, I'd like to continue on with this, but my one comment, I mean, it's always cool to me to be able to connect um, something. You know, I remember I was at an astrological conference a few years ago and when virtual reality was all the rage. And I think it was Ken Bai who was working on a VR app. So you could actually stand at your location in Google Earth, you know, at where you were born at the time of your birth. And you could actually look at the sky and see every, and you could actually turn constellations on and off and you could see where the planets are in relation. But that also reminded me, and, and then I had a similar idea too, which was that when I was younger, I was fascinated by a lot of ancient mysteries. And I, I spent a lot of time traveling and I went to, um, you know, for instance, you can go to Chichen Itza, I spent time in Mexico and so on. And under, in most of these ancient, structures, there are very specific dates, usually the solstices and the equinoxes. And on the solstices and the equinoxes, you have these very special properties that happen where, you know, you can, you can see, for instance, in Chichen Itza, you can see a shadow snake appear because of the way it's built in perfect alignment to the solstices and equinoxes. So I will say it's very cool to be able to see a planet in a constellation, but it's also equally useful or cool to know that every year on the solstice, there's going to be a particular position of the sky. And if you look at that position of the sky, whatever happens to occupy that position is going to be in a sort of a sacred space for people throughout all of human history. I mean, it has been, you know, maybe it's in a perfect conjunction with the sun or a perfect eclipse with the sun or things like that. These, you know, humans love eclipses and conjunctions. That's one of the reasons I was so fascinated by 2001, a space odyssey as a kid, you know, oh, yeah. you, you, you get to see an eclipse from the moon and, and things like that. So I, I guess it's not really a question. It's more just a comment, like very cool that using this system, you get to kind of see the planets in the constellation equally cool to kind of get to see planets in special alignments on sacred holidays, if you will, right? Because, you know, a holiday, a holy day, or kind of throughout all of history, we've had these sacred days. Like, I mean, I think a lot of them may even have biological um, underpinnings. For instance, mating season turns into Valentine's Day and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I'd like to continue on this. It, it, I do there is something very pleasing about seeing the planets in Capricorn and then seeing Capricorn indicated in the chart. I mean, it does, it's, it's, it's less cognitive dissonance and it doesn't require um, the sort of mental maneuver of translating the zodiacal constellation to a, you know, kind of artificial degree and so on. So I, I see that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So it's very pleasing seeing the planets all bundled together, you know, <laughs> Yeah. And I would just like to say that, interestingly, you know, changing the astrological system doesn't change uh, the planetary alignments to each other um, or or doesn't change, you know, if there's a conjunction or not. Uh, just perhaps, I don't know, the day, I don't know, it, it'll, it might change the day, right? But um, like you can see in the charts, in the charts, all the aspects are the same, uh, you know. That's not changing. Right, right. All of the aspects. And that was actually, that's one of the reasons that I've heard why, regardless of what zodiacal system you use or what house system you use or any of that, you know, the, um, right, the transits are still the same and the actual planetary positions are, you know, still the, the same, quote unquote, if you're using another system of addressing them. Um, yeah, and so my, I guess the, the the underlying reasoning that I um, kind of I was kind of inspired by when looking at all this was uh, has to do with like neutrinos and and light and uh, how that all works in the imprinting uh, process. Um, so, uh, in my opinion, like um, so, just briefly, you know, neutrinos pass through planets basically and then pass through us at birth and that is what makes part of the chart um and you know three months before birth and all that <laughs> um so but yeah that's that's how it basically works uh and right. the position of the planet is the, pl the planet's a filtering agent and then what's behind the planet is passing through that planet and is 
then interacting with us, imprinting us in the human design terminology. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so, but the thing is, and the thing that I think kind of blows people's minds and they like, it just seems totally crazy that this would be, be the case is that, um, so the way that the gates are calculated, right, is entirely based on, uh, according to the human design official sources, you know, uh, the tropical astrology um, measurement of that planet's position. Um, so it's, it's assuming that, you know, the, like, like, like tropical astrology says that the sun is at five degrees Aries, right? So that's the number that's used to calculate the gate that you get for your sun, five degrees Aries. Mm -hmm. um, but if you actually look at the sky, like we kind of just did, and, uh, you know, see that the sun wasn't or isn't at five degrees Aries. It's actually, in a, you know, rotated by 30 degrees. So that, that's going to change the angle of light that is passing through that planet. And if, if we, like, kind of believe that not all neutrinos are the same, that, you know, there's some imprinting plan perhaps at uh, work, and all neutrinos aren't just completely equal and the same. It doesn't matter where they come from or which direction. Then if, you know, that rotation is changing, then that means that tropical astrology is saying that the neutrinos imprinting you are coming from a location they're actually not, you know, in like when you actually look at it. Uh, okay. I, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm following along. I just noticed that... Um... Zoom revoked their free yeah, I saw <laughs> for a while too. they were doing that. I think it, let's let's um, let's stay on this slide for now. I do have some questions. We can stay on the slide for a minute, discuss it a little longer, and then I, I can start a new Zoom if that's okay with you. I, I tried to just sign up for a pro account, but it wanted my credit card info and I don't want to, you know, yeah. I, I I, I didn't realize because the last time I did Zoom, they had a special, you know, COVID, everyone gets a uh, free, you know, all day. Yeah, whatever, yeah, but, um, me too, last time. It was... but, it, but it shouldn't be a problem to restart. So let's just stay on this page now. I do have maybe a slight comment here, which is just something I thought of while you were talking. And it was, you know, I'm always trying to mentally model how it works. And my mental model of the gates is that they are a symbolic form of basically a sheath through around the earth but while you were talking i realized for true sidereal to work because i am always trying to make things work i mean even if i don't think it works i still try to make it work and it would actually be on the outermost edge of the universe like the gates would be where the neutrinos are coming from in other words because as i understand it so just imagine the earth is my fist right here and then these are the gates around it. And then we have the planets outside of the gates. The planets are outside of the gates. And then the neutrinos pass through the planet and then pass through the gate and then affect the person. And because the conventional model and the sort of what Ra said model is that it's a sheath of personality crystal bundles around the earth, the order of operations would be neutrino to planet to gate to person. But if what you're saying is that the actual divisions of the sky each have different qualities, which we could say are equivalent to the qualities of the gates, then if you imagine the gates as the outermost edge of the universe, or the source of the neutrinos, in other words, the, the gates come first, and then it passes through the planet, and then it touches the person, right? And in that case, you really want to know, you know, it's because I guess it's either way. It's like if the gates are connected to the earth, which is how I was taught and how conventional astrology, sorry, conventional human design operates, then everything passing, it doesn't matter where the neutrino came from or even what planet it passes through. By the time it gets to the gate, what gives it the quality of the gate is the final step, in other words. But it sounds like from this model, the quality of the neutrinos themselves are the gates in other words you know like 
Like what you're saying is, you know, um, gate 25 is not fixed to the vernal equinox. It's not that no matter what's in the sky at the vernal equinox, it passes through gate 25, right? To get here, like through the sun, for instance, um, it's not that it's being stepped through gate 25. It's almost like starting as whatever gate it is and then being stepped through the planets. Well, so that- there, there, there's a subtle thing that's happening here, though, that I think um, ex- that explains, you know, your objection. And, and that's the fact that, uh, or the way I like to think about it is the, it's, it's the orient. So, you know, you said that um, I, 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 you know, kind of envisioned the, the gates as, or the sky being divided into fields of energy, okay? Okay, the thing you got to consider though is that that is changing, it's constantly changing. It's not set in stone like, like forever, this piece of the sky is gonna be gate 25. Like it's gonna be gate 25 sometimes, like, but, but over the course of like, like 26,000 years, a complete um, procession. Yeah, it'll be gate 25, one sixty fourth of the time. <laughs> right and it takes 72 years to move a degree and we have 5.7 degrees per gate so after a few hundred years a different section of the sky is actually behind what i'm calling gate 25 in the tropical system they're kind of moving against each other is what you're saying like the actual neutrino stream is moving against the tropical yeah and the seasons for that lack of a better word tropical system however the energy is always the same in that part of the sky and that's how it's calculated okay yeah let's let's um let's it says less than a minute left i'm gonna stop the video and then i'll just send you one more invite thank you so much for part one i think i feel like this is a really good setting stage let's keep this um tab open this i mean this this is a great slide and we'll pick right back up in three minutes all right thank you so much okay i'm gonna